Hello everyone and welcome to another Photo Mishmash, your weekly source for any and all things photo. I'm Christina. And I'm Toby. And this is episode 34. Going Global. So we're going to jump right into the weekend review. Um, but we're just going to first mention Moonvoid really quickly because they are having a special promotion. That's right. Until October 15th or 19th, I don't actually remember which date it is, 10% off your rentals. So I just wanted to mention that straight off the bat before we get into the weekend review that it's a great way to check out gear you're thinking about buying or something you need for, say, like a trip. Like this lens that we'll be talking about a little bit later on came from Moonvoid. So, give it a link, give it a look, link right down below this video. Yep. So, we can review. Uh, last week, we had a video about raw files versus JPEG. And right. we're going to have a discussion of some follow ups. That's right. Um, but we just wanted to let you know that it's up there. So, if you haven't seen it, go ahead and do that. Yep. Um, I, I think it, it went really well. We didn't get a podcast out last week. So, we're actually kind of doing two weeks in review. Uh, but one of the things that made me think is that our time might be better spent some weeks creating a short, sweet, informationally packed segment on some topic instead of just doing a broad podcast. So we might explore that in, in the future. Uh, yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, and so there was a travel interview that went out. Was that last week as well, or was it the week before? The week before, like? yep. Yeah, so you interviewed um, Adam Furtado? Yep, that's right. Uh, and, you know, interviews, especially this is a non-video interview, um, uh, you know, can feel like maybe it's not so interesting. I don't really want to hear this guy just talk about travel photography. You know, obviously it's my own interview, but it was really good. He has got some great ideas about gear. I think I asked some really good questions. And then he's got some great ideas about gear, about packing and keeping everything organized. He has a very specific system to keep his gear organized so he, that he's comfortable carrying it all. He's not carrying a ton because when you're traveling, as we are experiencing right now and starting to pack for this Italy trip, uh, it's a lot a, of amb ambivalence about what should be packed, what shouldn't be packed, hmm. how it will be transported. Mm -hmm. We can't decide. Uh, so it's it's challenging, and uh, I'm taking some of his lessons to heart as we are organizing and packing, and we'll be talking more about that. And I do 98% sure that I'm going to get out a video for you all um, sometime soon that is exactly what I'm taking and how it's all packed. So big to do. Look list. for that. But if you haven't already, I did push that pod. Or sorry, I did push that travel interview up to iTunes and the podcast as well, because obviously there's not a whole lot to look at, although we do talk about some products and I show those. Um, but really, it's good to listen to. And folks, if you're listening to us on iTunes, take a moment and leave a quick review. YouTubers, if you're not listening to us on iTunes, go ahead and pop over, because that is a great way for other iTunes and podcast people to find us and say, hey, these guys are talking about photography. I might want to give it a listen and stick around. So take a moment and leave a review. Check the logs. Uh, people are listening to it on iTunes. It's certainly, um, you know, numbers are good. I'm happy with the numbers. So uh, take a moment and leave a review. That would be very much appreciative. Thank you. Yeah. And so you've been playing around with the Sony A7R recently. That's and right. Have you put out a video about it yes, or not yet? The review, okay. the review went out. The review went out. And well, you know, I mean, they've heard from me. If you haven't watched my opinion, well, before I get to my opinions, you didn't play with it a whole lot, but you did work with some of the files yeah. um, because I did, I used it a little bit at some of the weddings that we've shot over the last two weeks. And I wanted your thoughts on the files that you're looking at, these 36 megapixel files. And it's not that the fact that they're 36 megapixels is so impressive. Yeah, there, um, there's a lot of dynamic range in the files, surprisingly. Um, and I kind of wish I would see that in uh, my 5D that I used to, to shoot. There was a lot of highlight retention, which, you know, reminded me a lot of film. I mean, I think it's amazing. Like one of the, you know, I try to emulate the look of film in my photographs, but one of the ways that digital files, my digital files, 
fall short is in uh, highlight retention. I have to be really, really careful not to blow up or blow out highlights or overexpose them um, to the point where I can't bring them back because that point or that threshold is very narrow. So um, I was very, very impressed with the dynamic range and the very smooth transition from light to dark. There were a couple of files that you shot in the dark that were of a sign, of a brightly lit sign, kind of neonish. I, I, I do show that in the review. Yeah, and yep. the transition from, like you could just see in the files on the 5D Mark III that the bulbs were just overexposed, no detail left, just like white almost. Oh, yep. Yeah, and in the Sony, there was still tons and tons of detail, tons and tons of color. So that was really impressive to me. It was, yep. I didn't love the focus peaking. It was very challenging for me to be able to find my focus. Sometimes the highlights that it ha highlights the edges of bokeh, which I can understand like why that might be sharp in a photo where there's, mm. you know, a lot of bokeh, but it's very misleading to my eye to know like what's actually in focus. So that I think could be improved upon, but yeah. Yeah. The and, files and are very nice. We were manually focusing the majority of the time because we were using uh, non-native lenses with the uh, Metabones adapter. Uh, so we were forced to manual focus. And the peaking was helpful, but there were times, as Christina mentioned, where it seemed a little off. Uh, and there were times where it thought it grabbed focus. So that wasn't great. I've heard from other users that only use native lenses. They find it to be quite snappy and on target. I also mentioned that it crashed. On, awful lot on me, or, or at least more than any other camera I've had up to this point. Uh, and again, from other users, I've heard very little of the similar results. It's not crashing on them. So I think it was a combination of the Metabones and maybe just having a slightly more buggy camera. But if you want to step out the door with out a lot of weight and capture the highest detailed, incredible dynamic range photos, the A7R, there you go. And that reminds me, Adorama's having a really nifty trade in right now. A7. Nifty. Nifty. A7, A7 with a 24 to 70 lens or the A7R. You can get up to like $340, $355 back. There's instant rebate. And then on top of that, you can trade in any working DSLR. I have right down there on the floor an old D80. I don't think I'd be able to sell it for more than 200 bucks if that. And so I Shh, it's, don't tell Adorama. They don't care. They're they don't care. They'll take it. Um, and so it's tempting. So if you're considering, take a look. I'll put that link right down below in the show notes to Adorama. I did a little uh, blog post about it somewhere, but I don't here right there. Um, and then I can talk intelligently about it when it comes up. There it is. So. You get you get the automatic discount plus a four percent rewards, so you get money to spend at Adorama four percent down the road, and up to three hundred and forty-five dollars in trade in. It's tempting. Now on the video side of things, don't say up to. No, three hundred and forty-five towards the purchase. There is no it. They they send you a box, you put it in there, and you've gotten the discount for that as long as the camera works. Really? Yep. And I read detail. They did this promotion a year or so ago, similar. Um, it seemed like a year ago they took even lenses and people were buying broken lenses off of eBay and sending them in. Um, I wanted to say about video for a minute because, you know, I, I was hoping that I could say this is going to be my video camera for the podcast or for my videos um, and my travel camera. But video really, it wasn't noticeably better than the 5D Mark III. It certainly wasn't worse. Maybe a little bit better. Uh, but not to the level where it really makes sense for me well, to I spend think this amount of money because they in my weren't, limited budget. They, sorry to interrupt, but they sorry. weren't RAWs, right? The video, you unless you're shooting a RAW video, you're basically still getting JPEGs. Each frame is a JPEG. Well, yes. So you yeah. still, you don't get the same yeah. dynamic range. Yeah. But yeah, but a little bit better. But again, you know, dynamic range, I don't know. And this is where my inexperience with editing video and grading starts to really show because 
Uh, maybe if I had been, you know, really able to massage it, I would have said, oh, this is a lot better. But for, for what I do, I didn't see enough of a difference in my real world use cases. Well, the only thing that I would think is that if you have a certain picture style set on the 5D, um, that you might lose some data that you don't really want to lose. So unless you have it like a neutral and it basically looks like a raw file. I had both set as standard. Okay. All yeah, right. Well, pause. all right. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, but then still, I mean, I, you're talking about a JPEG file versus a raw file. Like JPEG files are all the same. So it's not like Sony's JPEG files would have more dynamic range than yeah, but unless see, I they think were, we're larger. We're, we're definitely getting files. out of our zone of expertise no, uh, but when we're talking about video because logically. there is, well, but, okay. Talk to me about what the GH4 can produce. The detail in the 1080 video well, file. Detail versus dynamic range. Like okay. we're talking about different things now. Well, I wasn't talking about dynamic range. Oh, I was okay. just saying how it looks. In I thought general. you were talking about dynamic range. No. It, so, in terms of detail, yeah, that's. Yeah. Sure. Now, I don't um, we don't have on here the week ahead because we kind of fudge that sometimes. But the A7S review should be out next week, my A7S review. It's a little bit of a light uh, review, but it really hits on the kind of the real world uses again of this camera. Then there I did see a significant difference in video quality, uh, especially at the higher ISOs. That A7, you can focus peak on stars. It sees the stars in the sky. Handheld focus peaking. It's, it's amazing. So you'll hear more about that and see some samples next week. Cool. Yeah. So um, you have gone global. Yes. I don't know which if this is, is not as you, exciting as. Where else should it we sounds. stick it? <laughs> um, I did just want to mention that most Amazon links that I am sharing out now are intelligent links, which means that if you're in a country other than the United States, Canada, France, Germany, UK, Brazil is coming soon. It will take you to that Amazon store and I will still get credit for it. So just a reminder, one of the biggest sources of income for this whole thing that I do is you all using those links for yeah. anything, camera or otherwise. And that's a free way for you to thank us. So I just want to remind you all that. Yeah, yeah, so, remember that link. Remember that link. Below almost every video is a link that says go shopping and they'll be fixed up um, over the next couple of weeks. Yep. Great. So let's move on to news. Um, Creative Cloud rolled out some yes. updates for the suite, um, including Photoshop and pretty much everything else but Lightroom, right? <laughs> well, a couple. Photoshop, InDesign, Premiere, those all got updates. That sounds like everything else. Well, there's a ton of other Illustrator, stuff. Illustrator, was that updated? I don't remember. Okay. Um, I would be, I would you know, when you look, well, wait, look at the list. Here, let me pop the list open of the whole creative cloud. Let's pop it open. And then Illustrator, yes, got an update. Premiere got an update. Media Encoder got an update. Photoshop got an update. I've already updated it, that's why. Um, Lightroom, no update. Bridge, no update. And then all these other programs Bridge, I haven't installed. Smash. InDesign, After Effects, Dreamweaver, Muse, Flash. Look, at, I mean, these are all... This is all if you pay the full price for the whole suite, which we do. Um, I don't know why. So, why do we? Um, so I want to talk. Well, first off, I did do a post that went out a while ago. Oops, um, that said some rumors about Lightroom Six. Did you mean to open Illustrator? No, but they're looking at me right now, so they don't see that. Um, oh, and will you? I'm a little worried about your microphone rubbing the way you have it. Will you fix that? Oh, uh, why I talk. Um, Lightroom 6 should hear about a beta very soon, very soon. I, I, it's a little disappointing that we didn't hear about it in the summer conference. We didn't hear about it just now. This, all these updates were announced at the Adobe Max conference that just happened this week. Um, but we really, it's time. We need Lightroom 6 and the rumor is it will be fully out next year. Um, so we'll, we'll see about that. But I Why do you to, need Lightroom 6? Because it's more better. In what way? I'm going to call you out on it because you're making an outlandish statement and I don't think you can back it up. Oh, it's my outlandish statement. <laughs> that we need Lightroom oh. 6. <laughs> I, well, I mean, faster. Uh, you know, is it better be performance. Faster? That is the rumor. The rumor is it's not really going to have many more features. Sounds like a helicopter is going to land on our house. Uh, really, not more features. 
but they're really going to work on streamlining it, making that engine smarter, faster, better, more efficient. Okay. Which, you know, you would like. I would love. Okay. Yeah. So there, you need Lightroom 6. All right. I would love face detection. Um, so I can register a couple of faces and say, find these people. Uh, I think that would be nice. Yeah. That's um, really the only other feature that I can think off the top of my head that I'd really like other than being more streamlined. And I don't, it doesn't have to have that, but it would be nice. What I wanted to show though briefly is in Photoshop now, this is useful for photographers um, making watermarks and things like that. If you're not using Lightroom, which can automatically apply a watermark to all or your images. Or when you're doing composites and um, like just photoshopping things. Um, yeah, the, the times when I would, well, well, so is it graphics like PNG graphics or how is this? It's anything. So anything at all. So here's, here's the new features. Extract, PSD, assets, so assets, images. workflows. CC libraries in Photoshop is what I'm about to show. You can align objects with guides. That's nice. Things will snap and you can prepare in 3D models. So we're going to um, we're gonna just look briefly at the CC libraries in Photoshop. Uh, if you open, well, let's just um, open a file here that is recent. I Gosh, I don't know what this is. Oh, because it's on a different disk. I should have picked something better to... That do. Um, All of these are on different ones. Why don't you go to open okay. and just find a random file? No, let's just do this. Let's just make a new file. Okay, I got you a new have to file. Save it. No. Um, and over here on the right, I have these bits of things that I've stuck over here. Other times I've had Photoshop open. And this is in the cloud. These files are synced across all of my programs. So if I sat down on a desktop and opened up Photoshop and I was signed in to the same Creative Cloud, these files would appear. And so I've been using these for my title slides. And so I can just pull it out and there it is on the screen. So you could simply make a watermark. This is a very light demo, but you can make a watermark, pull, stick it over there. And then on any image that you wanted to, you could pull it out and put it on the image in different places. Now, can you stick images, like full images on there? Can you just open an image and try to grab it? And I believe so. Because that's so, what I would be interested in. So here's a screenshot of Lightroom not being able to open up anything. And I can, can you, yeah. drag and drop the whole thing over there. Awesome. And there it is, the background. That's great. Because and then so, you can just go back to the other file. In a drag and drop. That's great. Yep. Because my struggle is that whenever I need to copy, like say that I did a family portrait and one person's eyes are closed in one photo, and I can I want to pull the eyes off of another photo and that are open on that other photo, and you have to like open the tabs or like select all copy and paste. Whereas like here you just drag and drop. So that's. Hmm. Yep. I think it's a it's little bit practical. more targeted at stuff that you're going to reuse over and over and over again. But let's say if yeah. you've got a specially blinky aunt who's in 50 pictures, you can put her eyes open over there and then drag it out onto other ones. Not and just the eyes. But not the just whole the picture. eyes. The whole picture. The whole face. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that well, was a short demo of that new feature in Photoshop. Um, so the L... X100, is that yes, right? Uh, you're kind of excited about this camera, or well, maybe very excited about it. I think it's it. one of the most interesting cameras that came out of Photokina. There's two that are at the top of my list of most interesting out of Photokina, and this is one of them. The one market that is still selling well in the small point and shoots is your kind of advanced larger sensor, Sony RX100. We're now on the Mark III of that. Clearly, it must be selling well if they're making three different versions. Uh, very, that's a pocketable camera. It's got the one-inch sensor. Canon came along with their GX7. Very similar. We talked about that in the previous podcast. We, I think, I don't know if we were talking about the rumors or actually the camera, but whatever we said was true in both cases because of the specs were all known then. Another pocketable camera with a one-inch sensor. Well, Panasonic has come along and said, here is virtually a pocketable camera with a fixed lens. So it's not an interchangeable lens camera, but it's using that micro four thirds sensor. Why am I excited about that? Um, because 
it's really small. And the sensor is really big, <laughs> which is going to give you good low light. So one inch sensor compared to a micro four third sensor, huge difference. You're going to see a huge difference in noise at those higher ISOs, 800, 1600, 3200, beautiful on the LX100, not as beautiful on the Sony Mark on the Sony RX100 or the Pan or the Canon GH. So this one has a and... one inch sensor? <laughs> or this one has, I'm sorry, I may have zoned out. This one has a micro four thirds sensor. Okay, got it. And this tiny little thing with its micro four thirds sensor, and that's the same size sensor as the GH4, will be shooting 4K video. Oh, right, you mentioned that. I did mention that. Limited to 15 minutes at a time, no faster than 30 frames a second, but still, in this tiny little pocketable uh, size, you're going to get some really nice quality. You don't get an articulating screen. You don't get a whole lot of zoom. Set. You got 24 to 75, um, but quite nice. And it does have an EVF, which is important as well. People like that. So I think cool. it's really nice. We'll see how it does. It's certainly not cheap, $900. Um, and it's going to be available in November. I hope to get my hands on one to review for you all shortly thereafter. Speaking of interesting cameras. Yes. Um, tell me about the Samsung NX1. Well, that I think is very the other camera that came out of Fokina that uh, Fokina. Is, Fokina. Fotokina. That is very interesting. And we've been talking about it. And, you know, you readers and viewers have been great in communicating and chatting about this lens or this camera. On paper, this looks like a 7D Mark II killer. You know, I hate, you know, I hate using that term um, for a lot of reasons. Because one, well, it's Samsung and they're not known necessarily really for their cameras. And they don't sit on a pile of lenses like Canon does. It's certainly not going to kill the Canon 7D Mark II. But, I mean, it's got 15 frames a second. It has... It shoots 4K video internally. It's got an articulating screen. It's got a robust build with weatherproof and sealing. All of that, I should pull up the page so you can see um, a little bit as I talk about it. Uh, 28 megapixels, advanced, it's mirrorless. So we got no mirror flipping around in there. And that I think for this camera is gonna be a little bit of a drawback. One of the things that's coming out in these early discussions of the 70 Mark II um, early and mid discussions now is the fact that its autofocus is just impressive. So you've got 10 frames a second, but you've got along with that really good autofocus and tracking borrowed from the $6,000 1DX camera. On a mirrorless camera, I don't see people getting that good of autofocus at that speeds and that tracking. I think it's going to be good, but it's not going to be at that level. So that, that's a difference between these two, but otherwise, this camera has a lot to love. Oh yeah, and they got the Wi-Fi in there, right? That was the joke early on. It's like, Canon, why can't you figure out how to get Wi-Fi in this? Because it's weather sealed. Right, or magnesium alloy body, yeah. So, you know, they figured out how to get, ah, it's frustrating, it's frustrating. And there's a lot of people. There are some people who are like, I don't care if it has Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter. But there are a lot of people that, I don't want to call it a deal breaker, but it's certainly a big, pause and they're thinking of whether or not this is a camera for them. But I think the initial like hubbub about the 7D Mark II being a huge disappointment is dying down as people are starting to get their hands on it. It does sound like low light capabilities are improved. Not terribly, but again the 70D is quite good too. I hear people they reference DXO Mark scores, which those numbers, small, uh, you know, those numbers can seem like huge differences. I don't have to remember them off the top of my head. But real world differences between like the D7100 and the Canon 70D are very small. Very small. So um, I don't think people should get caught up in like those numbers so much. The real world applications, they don't mean nearly as much as they look like. They are, they can be a good place to start your judgment on, but then you need to get your hands on some real world samples. But anyway, um, I digress. The NX1, it looks really nice. Uh, again, another camera that I hope to get my hands on and talk more about more knowledgeably. I've never used any of the Samsung cameras and it's hard to tell how well they sell because they break out, they don't break out their sales 
separate from their other digital products. Hmm. Cool. Well, I'm sure that when it comes out... Are you intrigued? I am not really. Why not? Because I'm just not much of a rumor person. I'm more like, if well, I no... need it, then it, it pertains to my... Well, what rumors interest. are we talking about? Well, okay, yeah, you're right. Not It's not a rumor. Just like, I don't know. Not knowing exactly well, how it no, performs? I'm just not, not super excited about a camera that I don't think I would ever use for work. Why wouldn't you ever use it for work? Because I want a full-frame sensor. Why do you want a full-frame sensor? Because of low-light sensitivity and because of, of the depth of field. Yep. So. But for sports photographers... Yes. And the price is cheaper. Right. 1500 body only. Yep. Canon 1700 1799 All right. Well, let's move on from that. Okay. Um, so we talked about this already, but uh, I guess it was a rumor. Was it a rumor when we talked about the, I don't the know what HTC? We're about. Yes. Really? It was just it, rumored. Okay. So now it's official. Yes. It's that like weird, wormy looking camera wormy thing. Wormy looking <laughs> camera thing. Is is real. That's right. And dorky looking as we had, or as it had been rumored. Periscope is what some people are comparing it to. Um, upside down inhaler. It also, also looks like a worm. Like a worm. A worm? A worm. A worm. A, like it's chilly? Like it's a cold? Worm. Like, like a worm. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's pretty metal and glassy to be kind of wormy. Well, but... just it's shaped us. Okay. Doesn't it reminisce? It's a reminiscent. Tiny use. Yeah, it's reminiscent of a oh, worm. Worm? What about Chinese? I didn't say anything <laughs> about Chinese. You said, okay. <laughs> nope. All right, so we're going yes. down a weird All right. path. Um, HCC Re. HCC said pe too many people are, my phone's out of reach, are like recording events looking at the back of their phone. I mean, we see that at weddings. Uh, and this it's is this so little annoying. device that you can kind of hold up to the side and still be connected with what you're watching, but recording it as well. And it's, you know, it, it is kind of marketed as an action cam. 1080p, 30 frames a second, also does 720 at 120 frames a second, so you got the slow motion in there. 16 megabit stills, Bluetooth connectivity to your Android phone, iOS apps coming, uh, so that you can talk to it, you can update the time lapse, you can kind of control that. 200 bucks. Oh, it comes with a 68 gigabyte micro SD as well. Um, and a speaker. Uh, no on off switch. It's just supposed to be intelligent enough to know it's in your pockets and it shouldn't be recording anything. Uh, <laughs> and you whip it out of your pocket. Spoiler alert! Next time you whip it out of your pocket, it's going to be dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, charges by micro USD. So, you know, it's you throw it up against something like a the GoPro, I've made a post about comparing it against the GoPro Hero, which is GoPro's newest. That's how we haven't talked about the all new GoPros. Um, we'll talk about them at some point in the future. They're, they're better, they're more improved. Um, maybe with issues like every time they come out, the issue this time might be the battery, uh, extended battery edition working with the GoPro 4 seems to overheat. But, um, you know, they're about the same weight as the GoPro. This is actually really waterproof as long as you haven't drilled into the case like I have. Um, the other one is not quite waterproof unless you buy the little rubber plug and it's, it'll go underwater for a little while, but it's one of those time limit things. Whereas a GoPro and its housing, that's, that's, that's waterproof deep, 140 feet, I believe. Uh, no connectivity though on that, Go, lo, that lower model GoPro, the $130 one that's gonna be out. Oh, so now. are we talking about the GoPro or are we talking about the HTC well, we're talking Ray? about We're talking about both. I think we should just talk about the HTC Re. Okay. We're giving mixed signals. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to say what, you know, 200 bucks for this HTC Re Periscope B thing or 130 bucks for the bottom level GoPro. Hmm. You know, I don't know. We need to see the quality that I've seen out of the Re um, samples online is really less than impressive. And the GoPros. Well, it's unfair to kind of judge. The GoPros, isn't it? Because they are so processed when you see them. Like any marketing that you see from GoPro that is showing video that was taken by a GoPro is like unreal 
to super graded. Well, by I'm, I'm talking about the footage I've seen that I've shot myself. Oh, I see. You know, but you, beyond the fact right. that it's not very exciting usually, although I've done a lot of exciting things in the last year with the GoPro. This is my this is my about year anniversary with the GoPro. Oh my god. I know. You should just have a little calendar. I'm gonna for take your... it. I made reservations. Me and the GoPro for dinner. Celebrate. Candlelight doesn't do that well in candlelight. Uh, so the video I've shot, I, I am impressed. They're good cameras. Uh, you know, they, yes, as Christina said, the ones we see with the GoPro logo stamped on them are often edited so nicely that they look gorgeous. Normal people, you're not going to quite get that unless you really know what you're doing editing, but they're good. They're good for the size. And I think this $130 one is going to be as good as last year's models and that I have and I'm comparing it to. So, I yeah. don't know. I'd just like to comment on... Oh, you can strap it to your head too. Yes, that's what I would like to comment on. I mean, I can totally see some people doing that, but the fact that it's being marketed for like just an outing when you're like traveling, are you really going to want to have like a thing strapped on your forehead? or around your head as you're walking I don't know I I mean I'm sure that there are people that are gonna do that but I just I feel like there's not gonna need that there's not gonna be that many of them so yeah it's just a little goofy yeah um and I guess you don't always have to just have it around your head but in terms of like keeping the video straight with your hand and always knowing especially since it doesn't have an LCD screen it's just, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to see how it does because I feel like the market is starting to get pretty saturated with things like this. Right. And just because you change the shape of something doesn't mean that it's, you know, going to sell. So. Should we change the shape of this podcast? Yes. What shape should it be? Uh, trapeze. Trapezoid. Not a trapeze. A trapezoid. A trapezoid. Okay. What's next um, in this weekend shapes? Oh, yeah. So we were, uh, there was this article. <laughs> Why does it take you a while to figure out where we Because my screen had gone to success oh, okay. talking too much. Okay. Um, so the uh, Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Service, is trying to get photographers to take out permits before they take pictures for professional reasons at um, like US owned land. So just pub public, public forests, national forests. Yep. Um, we have issues with that. Well. So, so I've been mulling it over a little bit. Okay. And I was thinking that, you know, it sort of makes sense that can we say what? Well, okay. You, you said what it was. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it sort of makes sense that they are trying to regulate the documentation of these national parks from the perspective of like, all right, well, it can be really annoying to be in a national park trying to like, you know, enjoy it, and then there's like people taking video. You know, it's sort like of a takes, film crew. Yeah, so it's sort of like to the general public, it seems polite and respectful to, you know, for photographers to have to ask permission for it. However, who controls, like who stops the general public from like doing their own, you know, video and photo shoots and being disruptive to others? So I don't, now I'm like, I'm even more against it than I was before because there's like very little just control that you can have over that sort of thing. And I, I know that that's not why they're doing it, but that is just a benefit that I thought that could come as a result of more regulation, but it just seems like it's bad all around. Well, it's it's my issue first off is this huge nebulousness of this. What, what exactly are you all saying? What it sounded like first was basically anybody who came into any park wilderness area, any federal owned land, which is parks and wilderness areas, and wanted to take some pictures or video needed a permit. That's what it kind of sounded like at first. And they're like, well, no, 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 like, you know, um, officially doing that for profit. 
So then I was like, well, if I take a trip and want to make a video for you all on my YouTube channel and make money from that, that's, I can't really call it a profit, but I make <laughs> money from that. Um, do I need to get a permit? And, you know, they've since backed off a little bit. No, and also during this time, they said that the media, because a lot of people were like, First Amendment, the media can't go in and report on something. Uh, so they said the media is not included, but I'm not media. Uh, and they've also said private individuals w wanting to take pictures, they've said, no, you don't need a permit. But I think I'm still in a bit of a gray area. And how about uh, wilderness photographers who make their living making beautiful prints um, from shots in national parks and wilderness areas. It's really kind of hard to go onto private land without worrying about getting shot um, to take wildlife pictures and things like that. So it, they seem to be backing off a lot. This is a ruling that has been in place for many years. They just haven't enforced it. Mm. And now they're trying to clarify it. The public has the right to comment up until November 3rd. I'll put a link to that down below. But again, it's confusing. I don't mind a permit system, but I think the, the, the numbers, you know, bounced around were like $1,500 and a $1,000 fine. If you don't get the permit, well, actually, it sounds like you should just do it and hope you don't get caught. Because <laughs> yeah, even really. if you do, it's still cheaper than asking for the permit. But um, and it probably would take a really long yes. time to have I mean, the come permit on, the government. approved. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we don't have much to add to this discussion other than they really need to clarify it. And because it's the government, I don't think we're going to get a lot of clarity. But yeah. take a moment and look at that link down below and leave some quick thoughts saying that the um, public should be allowed to photograph um, for profit or not. Yeah, I mean, it's in it, our national parks because we're already paying tax dollars. But they can, you know, again, I don't want to say I'm not against any kind of permits because I think there should be some kind of check and balance against a thousand people trampling into right. the back country and some needing rescuing and things like that. Where, but, but where do you draw the line? I think that's the that's the thing. So do you, does it have to be like a crew of a certain number of people for it to need a permit or like bring certain, um, you know, equipment or like where would yeah. be the appropriate right. line to draw to say, okay, you need to file for a permit. Right. Um, so that's where I think it gets tricky. The thing that I'm trying to figure out that maybe I'm just being very oblivious to is why are they trying to do this? Are they just trying to earn some more money or are they really trying to benefit the general public and the national parks? Because I just don't see anybody besides just people being annoyed by like, you know, like just people that are just overbearing, taking up too much space and kind of, um, I don't know, just being obtrusive in general. I don't understand why the government has any business in regulating this I, I think it mostly is a money grab uh, you know we're giving them a hard time but because uh, you know they're tax funded but th their budgets are really tough there's a lot of people that have to cover a lot or there's not many people that have to cover a large area often and I'm not necessarily right. saying it's all managed as well as it could be but it does but we're talking I'm sympathetic about, to their budgets, but I don't think that this is the way. To but go we're about talking it. about like a nature photographer that sells prints or something, right? Yeah, like, how much possibly. money are they gonna have? Are they are they able to make after they've like already spent fifteen hundred dollars applying for the permit? Right. That that's unreasonable. Right. It is. I agree. So yeah, there's got to be some sort of like happy balance that they reach. Right. But tell us what you think. Um, maybe there's yeah. something we're Well, when I posted, I, Facebook is terrible too, um, speaking of things that are terrible. But when I posted this, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of sharing, and a lot of gnashing of teeth. And the general consensus was like, this is ridiculous. I actually had somebody comment that I used to, was a student when I used to work at Marlboro, who now works for a company that helps people get these permits. Again, as I said, this is a law that's been around. And I think for bigger companies, they were going about getting permits for this. Um, in the past and paying for them. Uh, I think your comment of like the size of the operation is a good one. Like, you know, when you, if you're talking about like an eight man film crew, then yeah. But if you're talking about me standing in front of a tripod by myself, maybe with Christina helping, um, I think that that seems a little bit 
arduous to say you need a thousand dollar permit. Totally. So, um, but but anyway, they this company does this. They help people get the permits for filming in the back country. Filming mostly. It wasn't too much about photography. Hmm. Yeah, I just you know again, is there somebody going to be enforced if we went in and took a bunch of pictures of some big horn sheep and then um, sold them? Is somebody from the Forest Service going to come knocking on our door? Right. And yeah. their little green and brown uniforms. They better not. They better not. <laughs> it's messy. They need to figure it out, but yeah. it's the government. But I that's like. not the right, yeah. I hope that that doesn't have the unfortunate um, ending that, you know, seems to... Screw the little people? ...be coming. Yeah, yeah, that's just not right. Okay, so um, my favorite rumor mill... <laughs> Um, oh yeah, we got one more piece here. <laughs> Before we move into our brief discussion, um, the T6i might be mirrorless. That's the rumor. I um, and I found that online. I, you know, I was waiting. Photokina, we thought T6i, maybe SL2, nothing. End of October, end of this month, in about two and a half weeks, we have the Photo Plus Expo in New York, um, and. There may be a chance, but because we've heard nothing, it's pretty unlikely. So the rumor saying, not until second quarter of next year will we hear or see the T6i. That is a long stretch, especially if you think that the T4i and the T5i are basically the same. We're talking about a solid two years since the T4i has been released at that time. Well, it better be different. So. That's right. That's a. I think that is an argument to the fact that it should be mirrorless. Um, you know, it's time to go in that direction. We've talked about all of these cameras are eventually. Look at this A7R that we just used. Quite a capable camera, focusing not quite there. And we're saying that about the NX1, but we are getting there. We're close. I think we're just a couple generations away from being on equal, especially at the entry level market of these cameras. So maybe it's mirrorless. I've got a post about that. I'll link to that down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Are you interested in, or do you think they'll take the rebel line, the entry level line in that direction? The A6000, Sony's, you know, kind of, I'll call it entry level mirrorless camera, although it's, then we'll talk about this in a second, um, sells really, really well, very well. All right, well, let's move on to discussion. Okay. Um, so first of all, if you have not watched the Raw versus JPEG video, go watch it. Mm -hmm. um, it'll make more sense what we talk about now um, if you've watched it. And it's just, I think it's a really helpful video. So, um, so just go watch it. Yep, but there were some great questions and comments on that video that we wanted to take a few moments and follow up with um, as part of this podcast and as a video that we're going to break out into its own discussion because when it's short and sweet, more people will watch. Um, so the first question that stood out to me, which actually you answered it, but I thought it was good to discuss, mm -hmm. um, is from Michael Bishop. I shoot RAW all the time, but I've seen where it could be good to have your camera set up to shoot RAW and JPEG at the same time. If you get home and something happens and your photos are and files are corrupted, the software cannot recover the raw files, but can recover JPEGs. That is not true. Um, photo recovery software will recover raw files. I mean, it's all data and it's all organized on the memory card in similar ways. So data recovery software can pull both types of files. Um, your raw file will still have more information than the JPEG file. Um, it will probably be recovered as a TIFF instead of a RAW file, but TIFFs are files that hold more information than JPEG files. So mm -hmm. either way, you're still better off shooting RAWs. You still can get back more data than you were to begin with. Yeah. And you can recover RAW files if your camera, uh, or I mean your card is corrupted. Yeah. And I would say it's unlikely that your card would get corrupted in such a way that just the RAWs would, but the JPEGs wouldn't. Right. The only time I could see that is if you have a camera where you have two card slots, you're shooting RAW to one and JPEG to the other. Maybe the one card that is shooting RAW happens to get corrupted, but it could also be vice versa. So. Don't, don't not shoot raw because you're worried that they'll be harder to recover if there's a corruption. Yeah. Um, so Christos5120 says, I just wonder, 
When digital photography replaced film photography, one of the benefits was that the photographer didn't have to develop the film and print photographs, a time-consuming, expensive, and tedious procedure. With RAW, you need A, a powerful multi-core computer with internet access, B, a good calibrated monitor, C, lots of hard disk space, and D, time to process the RAW files, expensive software, and F, expertise of the software. I think I skipped an E, but anyway. Yeah. For the pros, um, it was always the same procedure and it will always be that way, but I think the average enthusiast user needs a better camera that can shoot JPEGs and have a result that looks great directly out of camera. And I think most camera manufacturers don't pay much attention to this because there's always raw. What do you think? Um, I, I'm going to say that's a good point, yes. Um, I think that for enthusiasts, yeah, editing raws might be a little bit too much or a little bit of extra work. But I think if you're shooting JPEGs, a lot of enthusiasts who do shoot JPEGs will still edit their pictures afterwards. Like we're not discussing, you know, um, the likelihood that you're going to edit JPEG files versus RAW files. We're discussing the fact that if you do want to edit JPEG files, um, you are going to be better off if you shoot RAW. So I know that's kind of like walking around that common question, but... Um... Well, a couple of points Okay. To, uh, to refute. I think, you know, towards the end there, Christos, I think you, you were the same, the enthusiast thing, yes. But um, a good calibrated monitor. Well, again, as Christina said, many people who are shooting pictures, JPEG or RAW, do a little bit of editing to their pictures. The right. monitor should be calibrated either in way. either case. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you're shooting JPEG or not. Um, lots of hard disk space, yes, you need more, um, but we're talking, when t uh, you know, I just posted a B and H deal this week, a three terabyte drive for $90. That is a lot of space. You have to take a lot of raw pictures to fill that up. So, and then you have to take gajillions of JPEGs to fill that up. So, or maybe I just argued in my sense against it. Yeah. D, he put these into A, B, C, and D and stuff. Oh, did I say multi-core computer? Yeah. No. Not really. I mean, all, com all computers today are, I mean, all of these have multi-core, multi-threaded processes in them. It's not so much an issue. You can certainly edit raw. Lightroom can capably run on um, less than a high-end machine. Basically, any low-end machine you buy today can run Lightroom fine. And we just heard about... Um, Adobe bringing Photoshop to Chromebooks via the cloud. So that, that system is coming. We're not too far away from cloud versions of Lightroom where all of that processing is done in somebody's big processing warehouse um, and you are just it's just being streamed to you. I think you also say they have to have internet access. You don't have to have internet access to edit raw files. To keep your computer up to date. This is, well, this is what I think. Um, th I think that if you're on this channel and you're watching this, that you probably want to take better pictures and be a better photographer and use your gear and get better pictures out of it. One way to really make your photos stronger is to actually edit them. Because like they did in film, they didn't just because you had to transfer the film, the negative, from an actual printed picture. They didn't do it because it was necessary or the, the processing, they didn't process photos because it was necessary. I mean, people dodged and burned and, you know, added and took away saturation and sharpened and did a bunch of stuff to pictures to make them look better. Not because they had to, not because that's what you have to do to print a photo. Um, they did it because it enhances the photo, which is why you would edit either a JPEG or a RAW. Um, so, Either way, I think if you're watching this channel, your ultimate goal is to improve as a photographer. So having good knowledge of how to dodge and burn and bring using post-processing to bring attention to your subject, I think is really valuable. Yep. One other point though, right? time to process the raw images. You don't have to process the raw images, but you have the ability to if you want. And the reason I say you don't have to you know, your camera, when you shoot a JPEG, your camera actually takes a raw picture and then makes a JPEG in the camera the instant you take it um, and applies your presets to it in any kind of in-camera processing. 
You can do the same thing in Lightroom. On import, you can have an automatic preset applied. I've shown this in a Lightroom video, um, and I'll put a link to that right down below in the show notes, that says, you know, apply a little bit of clarity, uh, add a tiny bit of saturation, tweak the levels a little bit, lens distortion correction, and all you've done is import them. That's it. You haven't touched the pictures. And it's just a little bit more of a smarter and more powerful engine, Lightroom, than your camera's brain, usually. So, yeah. Okay. And the last comment that we received uh, that I thought we should discuss was from Jay Swanstrom. And uh, he says that a benefit to RAW is that editing is non-destructive. And yes, but also no. Um, so you can do non-destructive editing to JPEG files if you use Lightroom and if you use certain techniques in Photoshop. Well, what does this mean, non-destructive editing? Non-destructive means that you don't save the changes onto the file in such a way that you can never come back and change them. So the way that Lightroom works is it saves a bunch of actions on your photograph um, in the catalog so that anytime that you change your mind or you want to add to it, you can always go back and either undo it or add more to it or just modify it in whatever way you can. Um, so, you know, when you edit sometimes in, in Photoshop and you save an image, say that you like added a ton of contrast, you save the image um, as a JPEG um, and then you open it again and the the contrast is still that way and you cannot undo it um, because you haven't sa saved any layers, um, etc. So it's probably a little bit more complicated, you know, that, that, or it's a little bit harder to explain than I, than I thought. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just because there's no visual right. to show them what I mean. Right. But in essence, destructive editing means you can't undo it. Um, and you can do that with JPEG. That is not to say, so with RAW, you aren't really able to do destructive editing because you never actually overwrite the RAW. There's no software that you can use to overwrite the RAW. I mean, Adobe Camera Raw, which is if you don't use Lightroom and you use Photoshop and you edit your photos in Adobe Camera Raw, it again saves that as an XML file, saves the edits as an XML file and applies it um, to the photo. When you open the RAW, you can still undo all of that. So yeah, they're non-destructive, but so are JPEGs in a way. Um, yep. So Jay's not wrong, but um, you know we're just saying that uh, others are new as well. I did want to say one other thing that's new in Photoshop. Oh, I didn't, can't bring it up easily. Is that there is now, and this actually came out in June, and I just missed it. Um, there's now a raw editing filter in Photoshop, so that you can, when you open a raw file in Photoshop, you usually pass through the raw engine first, and you can say, here's what I want to look like, and then Photoshop will open it up. But now you can go back into that by going to the filter menu in that. Um, there were just one or two other points in there that I wanted to, to pull out that I thought people made really good. Um, and that is we mentioned that usually you get a faster frame rate um, or a longer continuous frame rate when shooting JPEG. But when you have um, noise reduction turned on and chromatic aberration correction and lens distortion correction turned on, that camera, your camera is processing those JPEGs as they're being shot. And that actually can slow your camera down. People yes. reminded us that you can actually get slower burst rates from JPEGs. They'll probably go on longer because that buffer will get cleared, but it's going to be slower in between and noise reduction as well. QK I1111 said for sports, they find that they shoot small RAWs. They like that balance of trade-off of saying, okay. Um, no, but you still have to resize them. It's the same thing as shooting a as, as shooting a JPEG. The camera still has to resize the RAW. So you don't think you'd get more frames per second? I don't think it would I be faster because the camera still has to process it I'm, internally. I'm, I'm not shooting sports enough, so I'm going to go with what quick. They sound like they're doing this, so I'm going to trust them. I think that's not correct. Okay. Well, we should try it and say. But uh, again, I'm going to trust them that I think I think that the camera might be resizing them, but that is still faster and it's able to clear the buffer faster to keep that, that going. It's not faster than shooting full RAWs. Let's see. Well, quick 111, you got to let us know what camera you're using and we can try this with the 70D and the 5D Mark III, both of which allow you to do shoot different sized RAW files. 
not everything else does. Ron said, um, you know, Windows, Microsoft doesn't update a driver for him, so he can't see his raw files in Windows. There was some discussion with some other people saying, well, you, this program or that program. Um, Are we going to do other reader questions as well? Yeah, a couple, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're spending a little too much time. Um, but I think this is a good discussion. Uh, um, and, and so he can't find files easily outside of Lightroom. And I think, I say that's okay. I think you should all be all in on Lightroom if you have it. That should be organization tool. Every photo you take, no matter what it is, should go in there and be organized using the folder system. Keywords, all of that is more powerful than just using Windows folder system. But it is frustrating not to be able to see the files outside of that as well. And another point Ron said is that a lot of times you look at the back of the camera and remember what you're seeing in the back of the camera is the J embedded JPEG preview where any picture styles are applied. Um, but when you import to Lightroom, if you've shot raw, those are thrown out. An awesome demonstration of this is set your camera to black and white and shoot raw. The pictures it shows you on the back of the camera will be black and white. When you import them into Lightroom, you'll say, where are my black and white pictures? because that raw information doesn't hold what picture style you used unless you use the camera specific software, in Canon's case, DPP, Nikon's case, whatever it's called, Picture Professional, Raw Viewer, NX Viewer, NX Viewer. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, and a lot of times people say, it looks so much better on the back of the camera. You've got two things going on there. One, a little bit of JPEG sharpening was applied and probably a little bit of JPEG sharp uh, saturation. Um, and two, when it's small, looks a little better. It's hard to tell things are out of focus and things like that. So I think that was good. We had some other great comments as well, but uh, Oliver, you said surely the biggest con to raw is time. If you don't have the time to process again, using those presets that automatically it'll be better than a JPEG coming straight out of your camera. I guarantee it. Not always, but enough of the time that it's worthwhile. Okay, good. We had a second discussion piece that maybe I'll talk a little bit more in my packing video, but the we had a discussion. I asked you all what camera I should take to... We already went over this. Italy. Didn't we? Didn't, mm. didn't we ask it a while ago and they answered? Yeah, and they answered, and now I want to tell them the answer. Oh, yeah. Um, and a lot, a lot of great suggestions, and some of you had the suggestion of this little Sony A5100. Now, I thought the Sony A7R that's, that was really appealing um, for those high megapixel pictures. But then I thought, you know, doing a vlog um, or a vlog, whatever you call it, um, a daily video or being able to shoot all the time, anytime without getting a big camera out of my bag, something like the little Sony A5100 really appealed to me. And I have to be honest, thinking about doing kind of a little travel video um, in all different kinds of locations, I really like the flippy uppy screen so we can just hit the record button and then we're recording and we're talking about the pizza we just ate and how delicious it was and you can talk about the wine you just drank and yawn because you're jet lagged I guess. So and it looks great. So I'm going to be bringing this along. Only one battery. It charges via USB. I'm a little worried about that but we'll see how it works and yeah. Bringing it along with the 16 to 50 lens and the little teeny, which isn't that much smaller actually than the 16 to 50, um, the Pancake F2.8. And this little Joby tripod that was on sale the other day. I posted about it. It's magnetic. It's got little magnet feet in the bottom. Good for GoPros and things like that. Now for a lens, I'm bringing along the Sigma 24 to 105. Uh, I'll probably also bring the 70 to 200 and the 50. As I said, I'll go into more detail about this. But one, I wanted to use this as a test ground for this. I should be able to travel with just this lens out and about more often because it covers a really nice range. F4, um, you know, my own personal lens that I shoot at weddings is the F2.8. I don't care. I don't care about giving up those stops and having the optical stabilization will be nice if I want to shoot any handheld video or in lower light cathedrals and things like that. That is more useful than having f2.8 and I will be bringing along a prime lens for when I want the wider apertures. Also I need to send this into Canon because this little strippy strap is just 
That's the little um, zoom ring is just falling off for no apparent reason. It was falling off from very early on. So, Canon. Which reminds me, I should talk about my 70D. I haven't been on that. I haven't had time to test it more. I think it might be better. I don't know. So, okay. Okay. That was a brief discussion. I'll have a packing video for you with a more in-depth discussion. Well, you'll hear me repeat some of this stuff. Okay. What's next? Reader questions. A couple of reader questions. So, uh, and captions too. We had, we had this wonderful picture of uh, Commander Strong staring down the barrel of two lenses, the Sony a7R and the Canon 5D Mark III with a 50 millimeter. Angela said, those are some funky looking squid because he's a deep sea diver and not an astronaut. Very good, Angela. She's been paying attention. He is actually a deep sea diver from a set I had as a kid. Now that you all know that, you feel much smarter. No. Christian Garen wants some post-processing tips and tricks, um, or even better, a walkthrough. We've been doing a little bit of that in the image critiques. Oh, and the next image critique that's coming out, I got Christina to show skin tone adjustment some. So pay attention, watch for that. That should be out Monday or Tuesday of this week. Braun says, Captain Strong ready to stand in for tomorrow's podcast while Christina celebrates her birthday. That's if we had done the podcast last week, actually. But because it was her birthday, we didn't. That wasn't the reason why. I was sick last week. Oh, man, being sick just runs you down. The truth behind Apollo 11. There were several comments about that. Ron's got one small f-stop for man. That's clever, Ron. I like that. Beam me up, Scotty. Greeting earthlings. Only the strong will survive. And then JCB passes along a really good picture of a good photographer knows how to create composition. JCB, I've got no idea what this does, has to do with the caption or reader questions, but you should always watch your background for distracting objects or farm animals having sex. Okay, Walter. Several months ago, he purchased the 70D with the 18 to 135 kit. He's not pleased with the image quality, especially at the lower range. Raw images are not super clear and sharp, being somewhat out of focus and blurred. Might this be a camera lens problem or possibly settings? I pretty much shoot in full auto mode. Walter, Walter, Walter. I may send the camera and lens to Canon to have it examined and tested or... Thank you. All right, well, first of all, Walter, we got to... <clears throat> we've got to, well, the fact that you say at the 18 to 35 range and not across the whole thing makes me think that our, then maybe there might be something there, but we've got to reduce their variables. We've got to know what shutter speed were these images at that you're not happy. You need to take some bright outside pictures of a clear target 15, 20, 30 feet away at these focal lengths when the shutter speed is going to be plenty high enough. And also, I want to know what the aperture was. Is it at its maximum for that lens at that focal length? Because the pictures aren't great at the wider. We make sacrifices for these convenient lenses, and some of it is a little bit of distortion and softening, things like that. Um, so we need more information. And also, you know, get your hands on a prime lens. I've got that video about five reasons why we should have prime lenses. They offer so much more sharpness for the value. See if you can find somebody who's got a 51.8. Put it on, take a couple of shots, um, and see what you think. How different is it? Let us know. Um, you know, I, I'm not ready to say that it's the camera or the lens um, outside of normal uses. And also, how soft are they? Are you looking at 100%? Because with a kit lens, even one as good as 18 to 135, they're not going to be that impressive 100%. They can be, but not that. Kevin's got a great question. Kevin Blackshaw, do you think it's ever possible that a camera manufacturer would be able to reduce the sensitivity of the sensor to the point that it could act like a pseudo ND filter? I know some ISOs get down to five, ISO get down to 50, but what about much, lo about lower, much lower? I think that if that was possible, then it would already exist, as it does in some cameras with built-in ND fil filters. But all of those cameras, I did a little research about this because I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. All those cameras use physical ND filters that slide into place inside the camera. Right, that's what I figured. Oh, yeah. So they don't use the sensor. So I think the issue becomes, 
as you get down into those funky, really decreasing the sensitivity, you've got other kind of physics issues working. The dynamic range just probably shrinks to basically nothing. Um, will it be possible at some point in the future? I hope so. And I thought, why not, don't stop at ND filters. Why not adjustable neutral grade, grade graduated filters? where you can dial in and say, this part of the sensor, I can drag a little slider or touch with my finger to say this part of the sensor should be ISO 200 and then fade gradually to ISO 600 down here. Why can't we do that? Should we be able to do that at some point? I mean, that's kind of what we do in post-processing, but let's do it while we take the picture and give us even more range. One of the things I talked about with Adam uh, Furtado in that travel uh, photography uh, interview is about filter systems and Lee filter systems, and I know he and David both are big users of those. So I'd be, I'm, I don't really use it. I don't do enough serious landscape. Um, I'd be really curious to see what kind of shots they're getting and when it works and when it doesn't, and I'll be bringing that information back to you. So, um, yeah, I think the possibilities are awesome, and you should patent it and get Canon and Nikon to license it. There must be some kind of patents already because they do as you mentioned the ISO is below 100 you've got what's called native ISOs for many of these cameras and then below that it's just the camera um, under exposing the image and kind of lying to you about what ISO you're at it's not really same thing with the ISOs above the maximum it under exposes and then the camera just boosts it up it can't actually shoot at those sensitivities so. and we had a good question on the other page about getting Jane wants to know about having her a third party, a newer, newer external flash to set up for second curtain rear sync. Maybe it's just not possible with third party flash. And we just I'm talked briefly. I'm not convinced that it's uh, it's possible with the normal party flash either. Unless normal it's party flash. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like the. Is the podcast been going a little long for you? A little bit. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm not sure it's. We'll have to do some testing and revisit it, but, but I don't think it's we're possible. We're pretty sure that when we shoot with our Canons and our Canon 600 RT flashes, that that feature is not available to us either. Yeah. Yeah. But other folks comment on this if you know that you've been able to do it with third-party flash or the Canon flashes, um, and we'll try to experiment sometime soon. Is that everything? Can we wrap this puppy up? Perhaps. We've got to pick our flicker picks of the week. Here they are. And we don't know if we'll get another podcast out to you before we're back from Italy, but we will be getting videos to you during that time. And also I have some scheduled to go up if I can finish editing. Um, well, definitely the critique is ready to go. You'll get that next Monday or Tuesday. The A7S video is so close to being done that I can say confidently that you should get that. A packing video, but um, be patient about the other ones except for a video of us stuffing our faces with pizza. We're very excited. And remember, you have a chance to go to Iceland with me. I believe there's only one spot left now. Um, I'm really excited about this. It's not cheap, but compared to other trips of the same caliber, it actually is very affordable. And it's, um, it's a great value. Yes. It's, so you get it's, it's quite amazing. really so, great instruction with enough attention because it's a small uh, teacher student to teacher ratio um, and uh, they take care of all of the planning for you which is they just a huge basically take you to a beautiful location and show you how to take incredible life changing images in these locations so i'm excited and i hope that you all out there will join me and i'm excited about the folks that are coming great thanks so much for watching see you soon i say goodbye in italian Arrivederci. Arrivederci. So now I'm embarrassed. I embarrass myself. <laughs> oh yeah, what? I'm thinking of a title. Maybe it should just be Arrivederci. Yeah, if you can like really commit to it and say it. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Now I'm embarrassed. Why? Because I sound like an idiot. So? Not like you don't sound like an idiot another time. Down Periscope. About the little re. Mirrorless future. One small f-stop. Hello everyone and welcome back to another photo mishmash. I'm Christina. And I'm... I messed it up already. And it's not set to anything silly like... No.
that. Record two frames every hour or something like that. Okay. Nope, it's not set to anything silly like record two frames every hour. Oh. I'm gonna do like a horse sound. <laughs>